Hello and welcome back to Where's the Bowmagon. My name is Will and this is part four of our breakdown of the end of the world. If you haven't seen part three, then click the card on the top right hand side of the screen. Otherwise, let's just jump right back into it. We get a bit of casual racism from Cassandra as she describes the rest of humanity. Do you know what I call them? Mongrels. A mongrel, by the way, awfully, is the name given to a mixed breed of dog that doesn't quite fit into one class or another. This term would be used in a similar terrible sentence in Rosa when Officer Mason would use it to describe Yaz and Ryan. This view on the other progressive humans in the universe explains why she calls herself the last human, even though we see there are human-shaped beings in the galaxy all the way up to the year 100 trillion. I'm Jack Harkness, and who are you? Stop it. It's because she doesn't class them as humans, because they've mixed with other races and become impure in her eyes. Cassandra herself is another show-but-not-tell political statement. Russell T. Davis has said on numerous occasions that he was inspired to create Cassandra upon viewing skinny Hollywood actresses at the Academy Awards. He said it was horrific seeing those beautiful women reduced to sticks. Nicole Kidman struck me in particular. Nicole is one of the most beautiful women in the world, but she looks horrifying because she's so thin. It's like we're killing these women in public. We watch while you die. This personality of skinny models convincing others to become skinny is shown in this line. Is that why you wanted a word? You could be flattered. But we get a great response. It's better to die than live like you, a bitchy trampoline. <laughs> After Rose insults Cassandra, we see Cassandra's face and then a shot of the adherence of the repeated meme. This could be showing us that Cassandra is sending a command to them to tell them to kill Rose. I want to go into this scene a little later because it's really connected with how Jabe's death affects the Doctor and causes the rage and mercilessness we see in the final act. Rose gets fully smacked. Oh my god, you can tell Cassandra meant that hit. Also, why is there blood on the fans? Did someone try previously to get to the switch reset and just not have the Doctor's ability to walk through them? Apparently, the Doctor saying, What the hell's that? is a milestone in the show's history as it is the first time the character utters a minor swear word on screen. What a badass. Language. Jabe uses her Groot powers. Oh, by the way, this is a friend of mine, Tree. Language. Cassandra says, Bid farewell to the cradle of civilization. What does she mean by this? Does she mean the cradle of certain civilization or the start of all civilization anywhere? Because surely that can't be right because we saw the Ragnar spaceship fly into the earth before it was even formed. The Doctor and Jabe find the steward singed in his office and the Doctor says, You can smell it. This line is similar to the one Matt Smith's Doctor would say in The Doctor's Wife. Ah, well, he must have been redistributed. Meaning what? You're breathing in. Oh, God. We get a bit of fourth wall breaking as the Doctor says, Oh, well, it would be you. This must be a reference to the companions getting themselves into sticky situations that the Doctor has to get them out of. In this case, however, there is a good explanation for it being her that's in peril rather than anyone else. And that's, of course, because she was the one who insulted Cassandra. It wasn't that she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It also, it could be that Cassandra wanted to kill Rose so that she would officially become the last human again. After the spiders have approached the memes, the Doctor says, That's all very well and really kind of obvious, but if you stop and think about it... This could be meant to signify that Doctor Who stories won't be written in a simple way, where the most evil-looking guys are automatically the villain. Oh. It's not an evil plan. But that the stories in the future would be more complex than that. Eccleston, by the way, is two for two for episodes in which he pulls the arm off something. When Cassandra is outed, she explains that she was doing it for money. Five billion years and it still comes down to money. The disappointment on the Doctor's face is immeasurable and it is a motive that a lot of other Doctor Who villains would have, most notably Max Capricorn in The Voyage of the Damned. Cassandra teleports. We will see a lot of different effects to use for teleporting in Doctor Who, such as the Time of the Angels, the Girl in the Fireplace and the Sycorax teleports. I would imagine it's called a teleport. The Doctor asks Jabe to join him in stopping Cassandra's plan. You lot, just chill. This is the Doctor inadvertently inviting Jabe to join him, to which he will never return. This resonates with the deep message about the Doctor that you can go with him, but you'll put yourself in danger. You have no idea how dangerous you make people to themselves when you're around. A lot of people have said about the ridiculousness of the layout of this room, with the switch being on the other side of the fans. This layout is clearly designed, obviously, to be a tense final obstacle for the Doctor. But when I was looking online, I saw some people defending its position, saying that system restore switches are usually in places that are difficult to access because they are hoped and expected to never be used. Think about it, with electronic devices, you need a tiny paperclip to press the button. The positioning is also made difficult to prevent accidental usage. Plus, someone made a good point that the steward and other staff members are meant to know how to reset the computer without the switch. 
there's a scene set in the space station's ventilation chamber, and the doctor has to get from one side of a walkway to another to turn off a switch to save the day. You can only create something like that these days in CGI. So you have a partial set uh, with lots of green screen where the doctor is physically on the walkway, and this then gets shrunk down and put into a painting, effectively. I took the actual footage, the shot, reduced it in frame, and then this is all painted in along with this here. So, I mean, it really, from, from that original sort of shot, it, it suddenly becomes, well, it's a classic Jeopardy situation, you know, it's, it suddenly becomes something completely different. Seven. This is ideal for a, a match shot. This is the sort of perfect subject. Now we get to Jabe's heroics and sacrifice. The Doctor already liked Jabe a lot at this point, initially because of the flirting, but during the scene where she explains to the Doctor that she knows where he's from, there's a much deeper connection made, one that I personally think would have resulted in the Doctor inviting Jabe to travel with him. Let's remind ourselves of the earlier scene. Jabe and the Doctor are chatting away in the vents about Jabe's ancestry on Earth, but then she turns it around on the Doctor. And what about your ancestry, Doctor? I scanned you earlier. The metal machine had trouble identifying your species refused to admit your existence and even when it named you i wouldn't believe it i know where you're from forgive me for intruding but it's remarkable that you even exist i just want to say how sorry i am Initially, when she brings up his ancestry, he just goes silent again, much like he does when Rose asks him similar questions. This just shows that he isn't willing to talk about it with anyone. He just keeps it all tucked away. But she already knows. He probably almost never meets anyone who already knows about the fate of his planet, so this is a really special moment, because he can share in his mourning without having to physically say the words about what happened. This might even be the first time this has happened. A tear comes to his eye, which, to my recollection, is the only time Eccleston's Doctor cries on the show. Uh, played by Yasmin but also they've got fantastic character. They've got, they've got a story to tell and, 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 and Jabe unearths the fact that, you know, all the Doctor's people were destroyed uh, and that he's the last of the Time Lords. She wants him to know, I know, I know your secret and I, I stand beside you. And um, I think that's really lovely. I, I, I love that scene. They're almost like partners. And right up until the end, when they know that they could both lose their lives, maybe perhaps everyone's going to lose their lives, but they're, they're prepared to do it, and they're prepared to, to, to take the chance and see if they can save everyone. And, and they do. Well, but she, she dies in the process, but they do. When she willingly puts herself in this position, she says, stop wasting time, Time Lord. This could have been one of the first times Eccleston's Doctor has been called a Time Lord, and it puts a whopping great big smile on his face. This could be the moment the Doctor realises it's nice having someone around who knows about his past and the fate of his planet. Jabe is so heroic, hiding her fear and scared face from the Doctor until he turns around, because she knows that if he sees her being scared, then he won't get on with saving the others. Then, when Jabe dies by Cassandra's hand, we see the rage come out that is boosted by the fact that the Doctor met someone who can understand him and who was killed by Cassandra for money. We see a rage that is similar to the rage seen in The Family of Blood. Jabe's death is shown in the montage during Journey's End, and it is such an impactful death. It's two for two in the revived show, where the show has introduced a hero and good person only for them to be killed. Him experiencing what it's like to connect with someone who knows about his ancestry and history could be the reason why he gives in and tells Rose about it, so that he can travel with someone who knows about his past. Yasmin Bannerman, the actor behind Jabe, would appear again as Kathy Swanson in Torchwood, and Jabe would be mentioned again in the show. Having trees going to a building. Oh, never underestimate a tree, Lily. I met the Forest of Cheen once. She fancied me. In external media, such as comics, novels and audio dramas, like Clive before her, Jabe's legacy would be expanded upon. Just like Groot in the MCU, Jabe was survived through a cutting from her body. Her legacy would also be remembered by a shuttle terminus on New Earth being named after her, and the Tenth Doctor investigated some murders in the New Forest 
because he felt like he still had a debt to be paid because of her sacrifice. The original um, sketches that we came up for for Jabe um, involved her having a, a, quite a bark-like skin and quite a pointy nose. In the end, we, we went through all the trees. We, we kind of talked about, is she an oak? No. Is she um, an ash? No. And in the end, we decided that she was going to be a silver birch. Um, so that, that's why she had this kind of quite a smooth and shiny skin. I don't want to call us monsters, because we're not monstrous. We are just different. I feel like I've got a crown. I've got, I'm having my crown of flowers on now. And I've got a brilliant costume. It's like a robe. It's a beautiful, beautiful dress with lots of corseting. And that immediately gives you the posture of this. She's a queen-like figure, I think. And um, so as soon as you step into that, and with all of this, you're the part instantly. Jabe sacrificing herself to protect people from the sun rather romantically mirrors what her ancestors did for the earth in the forest of the night, namely protecting people from the sun. As the timer counts down to single digits and the show goes in slow motion, the script describes the Doctor that he closes his eyes, lifts his head and is in complete control of this single second. Apparently the computer's timed countdown throughout the episode is in real time. Now this is repeated in Chris Chibnall's episode 42. The final shot of the Doctor stepping through the final fan blade was reshot when the production team didn't like its initial outcome, which you can see in the video here. The Doctor comes back to the room absolutely on fire. He's just lost the first person in a while who understands him and he's looking for revenge. I love that he just walks straight to Loot and Coffer to let them know about Jabe's fate. His rage reminds me of this moment in Voyage of the Damned. This scene is one of Eccleston's best work in my opinion. Walking into the room, consolidating the forest of Cheem, and then has this semi-controlled anger that is allowing him to concentrate and bring back Cassandra. When he does bring back Cassandra, he only brings her back, not her surgeons. This shows that he always meant to kill her. Now this could be for two reasons. Either he knew the situation legally that Cassandra would get away with what she's done, so he just killed her, or it could be that he's so vengeful that he brought her back to kill her straight away because of what she had done. We get a great explanation speech of what ideas he has, and this is very similar to my favorite Eccleston dialogue when he's explaining the nanogenes and the empty child in The Doctor Dances. The Doctor reverses the teleport, which is similar to what he will do in Boomtown. As Cassandra is dying in front of them, the Doctor is calm. Rose watches and despite all Cassandra has done, she wants him to help her. This is a story arc that will continue over Rose's time with the Doctor, that she cares and changes him. This is reinforced in Journey's End when they will learn that the duplicate Doctor, that is the Doctor before he met Rose, is dangerous. This is also Rose watching the last of her species die in the technical extinction of her race. So this could be just as traumatic as watching her planet get destroyed. 23 years after the event of this episode, the Doctor and Rose would visit New Earth, which has been created after the destruction of this Earth. So the year 5 billion, the sun expands, the Earth gets roasted. That was our first date. We had chips. <laughs> so anyway, planet gone, all rocks and dust, but the human race lives on, spread out across the stars. Soon as the Earth burns up, oh, they get all nostalgic, big revival movement. They find this place. Same size as the Earth, same air, same orbit, lovely. All goes out, the humans move in. The shot of Rose looking out over the molten and destroyed Earth is so well shot, and it reiterates a message that is true of the viewer that we've almost forgotten that the Earth was destroyed because we were so caught up in the events of the episode. This is such an important event. Think of how many villains in classic Doctor Who wanted to destroy the Earth, and here it is, it's happened in the second episode. Now there is a danger of this that People would say, well, I know that the Slovene don't nuke and break up the Earth in 2006 because I saw it intact and get destroyed in the year 5 billion. But this kind of thinking is fixed in the next episode when the Doctor explains that time isn't fixed. Time isn't a straight line. It can twist into any shape. You can be born in the 20th century and die in the 19th and it's all my fault. This whole scene is just so great. The cinematography, the script, the music, and the acting. Billy Piper is in her early 20s. What an unbelievable actress she is. The Doctor can see how she feels and knows exactly what to do. Come with me. We get a beautiful rendition of Rose's theme. God Murray Gold gave us some of the best music ever. 
This scene was originally meant to be shot in Piccadilly Circus, but was changed to this anonymous location, and I think it works better. It just shows the normal everyday life that still goes on. You think it'll last forever? People and cars and concrete. But it won't. One day it's all gone. Even the sky. After what the Doctor has been through today, with him finding someone who knew about his past and enjoying them having them around only to lose them, he finally opens up, aware that now he feels like he can tell Rose about his planet and his race as he knows she can understand what it feels like having seen her own planet get destroyed. My planet's gone. It's dead. It burned like the Earth. It's just rocks and dust before it's time. The Doctor says that his planet went before its time. And again, this continues the theme of the episode. Everything has its time and everything dies. Then these two walk down the street. Around them, all these people having no idea what they've just experienced. This is such a great episode to just throw you into the Doctor Who universe. Now, this episode came out just four days before the public would learn Eccleston would not be returning in the next season. And the whole issues that came up with that and the horrible way the resulting entertainment industry treated the actor. We should be so grateful that we get to see this actor play this complex part so well. And I thank you all for watching my video. Now, I'll leave you with a goofier note. Now, this episode had a lot of people in alien suits, a hallmark of classic Doctor Who. And I found this interview of Tom Baker being grumpy when he recalls having to put on the rubber suit himself. Anyway, I let her sort me, but it was bloody hell. Before I play it, I'll just say please subscribe so you don't miss my unquiet dead breakdown and like the video if you enjoyed it. Also, let me know if you want to see some explanation or information type videos going into the history of Doctor Who characters or Doctor Who locations. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. A woman called Patty Russell was the only woman I worked for, uh, and she insisted that I play uh, a mummy in, uh, I think it was called uh, Pyramid of Mars. These bindings are chemically impregnated to protect the robots against damage and corrosion. An impenetrable disguise, wouldn't you say? I said to her, look, I don't want to play this. I mean, no one will know I'm in there. And of course, being a good old pro, she said, of course they will, Tom. Just because we can't see your face, you've got a special way of moving and doing things. You know, we'll know it's you in there. Anyway, I let her sort me in, but it was bloody hell. Okay, that'll have to do. How do I look? It must have been a nasty accident. Don't provoke me. I think it, I missed tea break. That's right, they couldn't undo me. And I could just see through these things, all these people slamming down big mugs of tea, you know, bacon sandwiches, all those things. Actually, maybe when I look back, you know, I only became an actor because of my love of bacon sandwiches and, and tea at 11 o'clock in the morning. And so there I was, you know, feeling quite sorry for myself. And someone said, you're hot in there, Tom. I said, how do you know? They said, well, I can see the stains coming. I said, those are tears. Those are tears. I'm crying for my bacon sandwich.